Grace and peace to you from Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Our sermon for today is the Gospel lesson. You'll find that printed for you on the back page of your bulletin. I invite you to please stand as I read that. From Matthew 3, beginning at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Father in heaven, these words are from you, and so we know that they are true. Through the baptism of your Son, teach us all the treasures that have come to us in our baptism. Amen. You may be seated. The baby Jesus has already grown up, but not without a struggle. His early childhood has been filled with turmoil, but his father has kept him safe, hidden, protected, all in keeping with his will. You remember that God gave his son and clothed him in human flesh by way of the virgin, Mary, and his first bed, a manger. His toddler years quickly found him in great danger. And so mom and stepdad whisked him away to a land of exile, a strange country. And after a while, they were told they could come back because it was safe, and then they located in a despised land, Galilee, the particular town, Nazareth. Luke gives us just a little brief window of this toddler, now 12 years old. We find him at the temple, reminding his mom, I am about my father's business. And he certainly didn't mean Joseph, did he? But his heavenly father's business. And now today, Matthew presents him to us as a grown man at the Jordan. So let's take a trip to the Jordan. It's not our choice but it's God's, and once we've been to the Jordan, we'll never be the same. The Jordan River served as an eastern boundary for the Promised Land. It wasn't much to look at, desert area, not much vegetation, and so it wasn't pleasant to the eyes, nor did people think that the Jordan was a great place at least to visit. Already in the Old Testament, when Naaman had leprosy, the cure, go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman didn't think a whole lot about that. He thought that was a terrible thing. Just listen. He was angry and he said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. The Jordan River, it's not our choice, but it's God's choice. 
God used that place as the inauguration of the public ministry of his son. That place served as the baptismal font for the Lord of the universe, our brother and savior. That place identified Jesus as the substitute for the sin of the whole world. He takes our sin and our place in that water. He appears there as God's priest, God, as, as God's prophet, the one who speaks as God's priest, the one who gives himself as a sacrifice and as God's king, the one who rules in the hearts and minds of the people of God. So not only did this place seem wrong, that is the Jordan, but John, who was doing the baptizing, thought the wrong person had come. Jesus, you can't be coming for baptism. John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then Jesus consented. John was the sinner. He quickly identified himself as the sinner. He was aware of a great distinction. Everybody who was coming to him in the wilderness by the Jordan to be baptized, they all had a common denominator. They weren't right with God. All of them were sinners. But now Jesus, who is one with God, no sin in him whatsoever, he comes and stands in line with tax collectors, farmers, fishermen, politicians, with the riffraff of society to be baptized. The one who came to seek and to save the lost began his public ministry with the lost right there in the Jordan. As Jesus steps in the muck and mire of the waters of the Jordan, so also he takes on the muck and mire of all of our sin. You see, to rescue somebody demands that you step into their difficult situation. And so Jesus does that very thing. He joins us in life dies the death that we deserve and comes to life again, resurrects himself to demonstrate that he has defeated death and fulfilled his father's desire. Now, St. Paul says of Jesus, the one who had no sin became sin for us. Jesus is the only candidate who could accomplish that? Have you ever looked at someone's job and say, I can do that? And that might be true. Or you're reading the paper and say, hey, that one suits me. This job, only Jesus, God's son, and Mary's son could fulfill. The one who had no sin became sin for us. Now, at the Jordan, God's choice, remember, the Father in heaven, his voice is heard concerning his son. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. These words of the Father connect with the words of the prophet Isaiah. You heard Pastor Weekman read those the father is saying his son is that promised suffering servant who has arrived on the scene. He's God's elect, his chosen servant, the one in whom he delights, the one on whom he puts his spirit. He was going to be wounded for our transgressions. He was going to be bruised. His stripes that he would receive because of our sin, they would bring us peace. The Jordan, it's not our choice, it's God's. 
Now, what Jesus accomplished during his life and in his death and through his resurrection comes splashing down upon us in the waters of our baptism. You see the baptism of Jesus and our baptism is intimately connected. Our Jordan is our baptismal font. And when we have come to the baptismal font, our lives will never again be the same. Baptism is a pipeline, God's divine pipeline, that delivers to us all the treasures of salvation. Everything that Jesus did for us in his life and through his death and in the resurrection comes our way through the divine washing of water and word. His blood covering our sin. His perfect life covering our sin. His death, we participate in that. I'll talk about that in a moment. As well as in his resurrection. All of those treasures come to us through baptism. You know, just as the Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism, the same happens for us through our baptism. The baptism of Jesus brings the blessing to the waters of baptism. The baptism of Jesus brings the power to baptism. Now, this can only mean that baptism is not a human right or something that Christians do to identify themselves as Christians. Baptism is the divine work of God apart from any human effort, any human work, any human notion. Baptism is God in action. It saves us. It ignites faith. It generates faith. It is the cause of our Christian faith. Water and word brings faith to the human heart. A trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. As you look at that baptismal font, it doesn't look like much. It might even appear to be ridiculous. Because you can't get in it. You can't get covered by the water. See how some people think? And then it even seems more ridiculous to bring an infant there who can't even respond or talk or engage in anything. But baptism is God's choice, isn't it? Through water and word, he forgives sins. He saves. He creates faith. Baptism delivers us from death and the devil and gives us eternal life. Eternal life comes by way of this grand washing of water and word. Now death, remember, tried to swallow up the Christ. But that couldn't be, because he is God himself clothed in human flesh. And so even though he did die, he raised himself from the dead. And now, for the Christian, the baptized, death is no longer a fearful thing, but it is the entrance to life eternal. As certainly as baptism connects us to the redeeming work of Christ, so also it causes us to participate in the resurrection of Christ. Paul teaches us that we've been baptized into Christ's death, and so we also participate in his resurrection through our baptism. Once we have been to the baptismal font, our Jordan, life is never the same. Day by day, our baptism calls us 
to drown our sins in the water, yes, in the blood of Christ, to put our lust there, to put our lies there, to put our deceiving acts there, to put our disobedience there, to put our pride there. You pick the sin. Jesus says, drown it in the baptismal water. Put it on Christ where it belongs and be raised again, resurrected in a new life. What's the catechism say? Let me read it to you. Such baptizing with water means that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil lusts, and that a new man daily come forth and arise who shall live before God in righteousness and purity forever. St. Paul says it, Romans 6, we're buried with Christ by baptism into death, and just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. At the baptism of Jesus, the heavens were opened. At our baptism, you know it, heaven is open. At the baptism of Jesus, the Father says, this is my son. And I'm pleased with him. At your baptism, God says to you, you're my daughter. You are my son. And I'm pleased with you.